Hello, this is Mrs Cooper with a video on how to answer question 3 in English language exam. And this is paper 1, Communicating in Information and Ideas. That's the non-fiction paper. Uh, so let's get started. Okay, so question 3 is assessing your ability to analyse language and structure in one of the two texts that you'll be given to read. It's worth 12 marks, so you should be aiming to spend about 15 minutes on this question. Um, and the assessment objectives that it's assessing um, are AO2. Explain, comment on and analyse how writers use language and structure to achieve effects and influence readers using relevant subject terminology to support their views. And this is how much you're expected to write for this exam, which is roughly just under one side of A4. Okay, so let's have a look at an example question. Okay, question three is about text two, President Obama's statement on the death of Nelson Mandela. Explore how Obama uses language and structure in the speech to present his feelings about Nelson Mandela. Support your ideas by referring to the text using relevant subject terminology. And in this box it tells you that it's worth 12 marks. Okay. You may have noticed that I've looked at the question before I've looked at the extract. And this is a strategy you might want to consider for the exam yourself reading the question paper before you read the extracts because then you'll know what you're looking for before you begin to read the text so you could already start highlighting annotating and labeling information for writing up your exam it might make the whole process a bit quicker um, but try it see if it works for you um, and perhaps one of your mocks so the first thing that I'd be thinking when I've read the question is what are the keywords now this is really important because every single year there are uh, students that misread the question in a rush, in a panic, under the exam stress and make silly mistakes and it costs them marks. So do take that time, read in it carefully. The first simple mistake that you could make is just not talking about the right text, which sounds silly but um, it does happen. Um, I'd then be thinking, okay, the next, the key next uh, words for me are this idea of language and structure. And this is really, really important for question three. You must have an equal balance of references to language and structure to gain high marks. It says it in the mark scheme. You've got to be talking about both equally to get good marks for this question. And then drawn to the fact that this is a speech rather than an article. So I'd be thinking in my answer, I'd be talking about the effect on the audience rather than the effect on the reader. Because then I'm just going to impress my examiner that little bit more by showing that I've considered the use of form, okay? And then I'm drawn to this idea of his feelings about Nelson Mandela. So clearly this question wants me to look at emotion. So I'll be looking at what language devices and structural devices are used to convey, to, to show Obama's feelings about Mandela. Then here, it's very important that you must refer to the text. If you don't use quotations, you're not going to be getting a good marks here. Again, it sounds obvious, but every single year students do it and they miss out on marks. What you don't want to do is copy indiscriminately from the text. You want to select the most precise quotations, embed them, and spend time writing your own words about the effect on the audience using relevant subject terminology. Hopefully you know what this means, but these are terms that are relevant to your subject the subject here is English language, and we know we're talking about language terms and structural terms. So let's have a look at them. Okay, so you might have um, seen most of the devices on here previously. Um, if you don't know any of these, and I don't talk about them in a moment, do speak to your teacher or come speak to me and we'll explain them in detail. Okay, notice that I've broken them down into language and structure, because I've got to talk about both equally. Uh, one thing to bear in mind for uh, your language exams is that the type of devices that a writer will use will vary depending on if it's a non-fiction text or a fictional text. In a fictional text, you're more likely to see devices like these, um, similes, metaphor, personification, imagery. You might find some of these in non-fiction texts, but they're probably less likely. The ones that you are going to find are things like um, opinion, facts, statistics. Um, so I'll touch upon some of these now, and if that you don't know, do ask for teachers. Okay, so hyperfora, really simply, is when a writer gives a question and then answers it themselves immediately. So 
Uh, what would it be like to go to America? Well, it'd be fantastic, it'd be sunny, it would be um, amazing. Anecdote is a story from um, someone's own life that is given in an article or in a speech to um, support a particular idea. So if I was writing an article about loneliness, I might refer to a time when I felt lonely. Allusion is uh, when a writer makes a reference to something else to support their own topic. So if I was talking about cavemen, I might make a reference, an allusion to the Flintstones. Hyperbole is the use of deliberate exaggeration for emphasis. Um, exclamatory, declarative and imperative sentence types. An exclamatory se uh, sentence is when a um, writer makes a, an exclamation. So I was the happiest I'd ever been. A declarative sentence is one that makes a statement. So um, Paris is the capital of France. An imperative sentence is one that um, gives an order. So stop what you're doing now and listen to me. Stop and listen are the imperative verbs there. Okay, structure. Um, there are many things that you might want to look at structure, but these are probably the most common ones that you might see in a nonfiction text. Um, obviously, sentence types and tricolon. So that's the rule of three. So three successive clauses, three uh, adjectives like the Discovery Academy is bright, brilliant and wonderful. Order of events is another good one to um, remember. So what does the text begin with? What does the writer then move on to? And how does the text finish? Topic changes is similar to order of events, but it's how does the topic change that's important. Is it a sudden juxtaposition from one idea to the next? And often that's used to shock the reader or to show difference, contrasts. So talking about day and then talking about night immediately. Um, sometimes it might just be a subtle, gradual change. So for that one, and then indeed for all of these, it's not just about spotting them. More importantly, it's about why has the writer used this? What's the intended effect? Okay, so this is the particular article, uh, sorry, speech that um, we are looking at for this question. So I'll give you a few moments just to read it, see if you can spot any, any of the devices that we uh, talked about before or any others. Um, and what the effect is. Okay, so the first thing that I notice is that Obama begins with an illusion. Make an illusion here in this speech to Nelson Mandela's trial in 1964. So he's locating his own speech in a particular historical and um, a key historical event in the past. This whole paragraph is doing that. Um, and then in the second paragraph, he moves on to describing Mandela in his own words. So this is where we're starting to see his feelings really come into it. Um, particularly in the middle here, Obama uses the lovely tricolon to describe um, Mandela. So he refers to him as the most influential, so that's adjective number one. Courageous, adjective number two. And profoundly, that's an adverb, good, adjective number three. So influential, courageous and good, they really make Mandela sound like a kind of godlike sort of figure, a saint, if you will. So clearly Obama feels uh, a sense of admiration to Mandela here. Okay, We're going to have a look now at an example answer that... Um, OCR have released um, in relation to this question. And let's see what the students written and why this is so good. So, the passage becomes a eulogy to Nelson Mandela twice over. A eulogy is a speech written um, in a tribute to somebody once they've died. Once in his own words, and once again as restated by Obama. Statement thus becomes understatement, and not only is Mandela given what many would argue is an appropriate eulogy, but also the second intention to further Obama's credentials is achieved by the close associations that are established. So here the students talking about the intention of Obama's speech, the purpose of his speech. And that is a, a really key and perceptive um, piece of analysis here. And quite cleverly, she said that Obama's purpose is not only to give Mandela a tribute, a eulogy, but actually he's got another, his own agenda. 
but he's actually making him sound better and, and more of a higher status and more knowledgeable by his associations with Mandela here. And then she says here, the opening reference, so the allusion, is a substantial one. And she's right. If you have a look, it's a very large opening paragraph there um, in Mandela's own words. It begins with a specific reference to a time and place, which suggests the contrasts that are developed. The first of these is the overall one of Mandela speaking out in the name of freedom and democracy from the dock. Here she's embedded a quotation in which combines both the legalistic and colloquial suggestions of guilt, which I think that was supposed to be that. Um, here they're talking about connotations. So connotations are ideas linked with a word. The word dock, the noun dock, um, is linked with legal, so you'd stand in a dock to give evidence, and obviously associated with guilt as well. The distinction between this suggestion and the huge tricolon I have fought, I have fought, I have cherished, which follows, is emphasised by the key verb cherished. Um, okay, so what the student's doing here is quite clever. They picked up on a structural device of a tricolon, and then they've actually picked up on the language here. They dig deeper into the language. So try and do that yourself. Pick up on perhaps a longer structural device and then the language which suggests both powerful emotional attachment and long perseverance in his cause. Powerfully convincing emphasis comes from the balance and repetition of the first two phrases and is developed in the secondary triple of dem democratic and free, live in harmony, equal opportunities. This is built to a resounding climax. Here the students talk about structure. So remember when we said about topic change, what a uh, text begins with, what it builds up to, how it ends. This is what they're doing here. Climax is the high point of a speech or an article or a story. With a further balance and repetition of it is an ideal, punctured by the deliberate breaking of a grammatical rule to achieve, but if needs be, to add conviction to the conclusion that rules sometimes need to be broken to achieve a greater good. Okay, what the student's doing here is quite clever. So this is a this is the quotation uh, that Obama's made in his speech. And if you look, it is it is actually a bit unusual. It's a bit like a Yoda speech. Um, what, it sh what he should be saying here is, but, comma, if needs be, to achieve. But he's broken it, he's kind of changed the what we call the syntax of a sentence. He's ordered it in a different way. And what the students cleverly picked up in here is that by breaking those grammatical conventions, those norms, that links to kind of the idea of um, rebels um, as people. And if you do know of Mandela and Obama, really, they're both kind of not ordinary, normal figures. They're both a bit unusual. First black pe uh, president, obviously Mandela kind of broke a few rules uh, to achieve his aim of um, getting, getting civil rights. Um, so she's linking the grammar to the kind of intention there, which is very clever. So we don't have time to read all of this, but let's have a look at the examiner commentary as to why this is such a good response. So the examiner writes, this is a highly sophisticated response combining sharp analysis of rhetorical devices with a precise understanding of how the speech is structured for maximum impact on the reader. There is a clear overview of the text, so a clear understanding which identifies the purpose of the speech as an appropriate eulogy to Mandela, but also to further Obama's credentials by the close associations that are established. The candidate analyzes each paragraph in detail using precisely selected subject terminology throughout. The observations about language and structure are consistently integrated, that means embedded in a detailed and knowledgeable response. Okay, so clearly she got marks for showing understanding of purpose. Marks for embedding her quotations. Marks to talk about language and structure, um, and showing her knowledge um, of the effect there. So it's it's not too hard if you think about it. What you want to try and do is think overall: what is the purpose? What are the keywords that stand out? What are the devices, language, structurally, um, and really try and put that into your own words. So good luck. If you've got any other questions, ask your teacher, speak to me, um, and thanks for watching.